Okay. So welcome everybody. Um, just to say uh, once again, please put off cameras and mics um, to uh, keep it all simple. Please, if you tweet, use hashtag cutting edge issues. Um, as you listen to the speaker and as you start to get questions, please could you put them in the chat function? Um, we have somebody monitoring chat and gathering groups of questions for the Q&A session at the end. Um, but I think um, I will get started properly. Oh, one other thing to say. If you came on to uh, this series last week, we had a spectacular malfunction. Um, despite being in Singapore, the home of all things techie, uh, Danny Kwa's computer basically exploded five minutes into his talk. Uh, he wasn't harmed. And we have asked him to come back on the 11th of December uh, to give the talk he was going to give last week. So if you did come and, ha and, and still want to listen to Danny, um, come along on the 11th of December at the end of this, this term series. OK, let me get started properly. Our main speaker today is a legend in climate change circles, uh, Salim al Huck. He is uh, a scientist, a uh, biologist, I think, um, and an activist who has attended every single global negotiation on climate change since 1992. And for that alone, he, he, he should get several medals, I think. Um, he is currently the director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development in Dhaka, uh, Bangladesh, and a senior fellow at the International Institute for Environment and Development, IIED, in London. Um, he's got a long list of other affiliations and yeah, publications. Yeah, yeah. And, um, He's, I come across him. Could people turn off their mics, uh, by the way? Um, thanks. Mics and cameras off, please. Um, I come across him because he is also uh, hyperactive on social media. Uh, he tweets. He seems to be particularly obsessed with the US elections right now, but um, he may talk about that. Um, he does great daily updates from the big climate change negotiations, uh, very short videos from the belly of the beast you know, in, the, in the conference chamber. Uh, as we used to have. Um, so he's definitely someone to follow on social media. He's going to talk for about 40, 45 minutes on the theme of uh, climate change negotiations and loss and damage. We're then going to have a discussant who is uh, Kathy Hochstetler, who, who, apart from being my boss, which is obviously a very important position, um, is a professor of international development and the head of department at uh, the LSE, the International Development Department at the LSE. And she is really perfect to be the discussant because her work is really on the overlap between environment and development. And so we asked her to come along and, and give sort of brief thoughts on the basis of, of Salim Al, Salim's presentation. And we'll then go to Q&A and we'll gather up your questions in the chat and we will proceed. So without further ado, Salim, take it away, please. Great, thank you very much, Duncan. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, and uh, good evening to Cathy. Thank you for... Uh, uh, agreeing to be a discussant today. I look forward to your contributions uh, later. So what I um, propose to share with you and your audience uh, uh, this evening uh, from Dhaka, Bangladesh, where I'm speaking, it's uh, fairly late in the evening for me here, um, is my story, as it were, in the uh, climate change negotiations. As you mentioned, I've been uh, attending every single one of the annual conferences of parties uh, from the very beginning. Uh, I don't go to these as a negotiator, I go as an observer, uh, but I do have a role in the negotiations as an advisor to the group of least developed countries, which is uh, a group of 48 countries that are recognized UN uh, caucus group called the least developed countries. Most of them are in sub-Saharan Africa, but a few in Asia, including my country, Bangladesh. And I advise that group, uh, it's currently chaired by Bhutan. Uh, I've been advising that group uh, from the very beginning on the negotiations, initially for many years on the issue of adaptation, but more recently on the issue of loss and damage. And what I propose to do is to share with you the evolution of uh, the climate change issue as it has evolved both on the scientific side as well as on the uh, global negotiations and policymaking side, and then uh, give you a sort of update on the state of play, particularly on this issue of loss and damage. 
uh, and then I'll be very happy to take uh, questions uh, from the audience uh, uh, after that. Uh, so let me start at the very beginning in what I call the first era of the climate change uh, issue. And I'm going to argue that we've uh, gone through several eras and we are now in the third era. So let me explain what I mean by that. The first era was, and each of these eras are characterized by how the problem was perceived, which then um, provides the, uh, the framing of the solution to that problem. So how you frame a problem also uh, provides you with the framing for the solution. So the initial problem was framed as emissions of greenhouse gases from burning fossil fuels, in particular coal, petroleum, natural gas, other sources like methane uh, and, and agriculture, cutting down trees, etc. So a variety of sources of uh, uh, greenhouse gases uh, accumulating in the atmosphere, causing uh, global warming over time. And that was the problem. So it was uh, the solution therefore was let's stop emitting these greenhouse gases. And in the climate change jargon, we call that mitigation. And because this is a global problem that all countries need to get together to uh, address, a, we formed a global agreement, a global treaty, all countries agreed to that treaty. It's called the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, every country signed it and adopted it and agreed that they will take action uh, to reduce their emissions. So that's a universal agreement. All countries have agreed. And interestingly enough, even uh, the, uh, the withdrawal by President Trump is not from the framework agreement. It is only from the Paris Agreement, which came uh, many years later. And I'll come to that in a little while. So the United States, even under Trump, and if they go through with the um, withdrawal from the Paris Agreement is not withdrawing from the framework agreement, which is the original agreement uh, that the US uh, still continues to be part of. Um, and for many years, and, and under the framework convention, there's an annual conference of parties where all the countries come together uh, towards the end of the year, November, December, that event uh, moves from continent to continent. Um, uh, and it's been going on for the last 25 years the next one, which will be the 26th uh, annual conference of parties was due to be held this November in, a, in, a, in another month's time in Glasgow in Scotland, hosted by the United Kingdom government. Uh, but because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, it's been pushed back by a year. So it will now be held in November, 2021. Hopefully in Glasgow, we can still attend uh, by that time. Uh, and. Uh, and so we, we are pushing it back by a year and I'll, I'll come to uh, what, what is going to happen there on this topic. But essentially the countries have agreed to take action on mitigation and they've gone and, and done whatever they can, but unfortunately not enough. Uh, countries are trying their best to, to reduce their emissions, but uh, they have not been able to reduce emissions. We continue to increase emissions as we go forward. And we've been doing that consistently since the framework agreement started uh, more than 25 years ago. Then over the course of time, we moved into what I call the second era. And the timing of this is at the turn of the century 2001 in particular, when the third assessment report of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the UN body uh, uh, that does the science assessments and produces these periodic assessment reports on the state of science on climate change. And in the third assessment report, which came out in 2001, uh, they said that we hadn't been uh, sufficiently active or successful in reducing emissions. Temperatures are going up, uh, concentrations of greenhouse gases are going up. And if they continue to do so, then we will inevitably now see some level of warming and some level of climate change related impacts that are now going to be unavoidable and un, un, uh, we cannot prevent them from happening. Uh, and so we now have a second problem uh, which has to be dealt with with a second set of solutions. And the second problems uh, 
is unavoidable and inevitable impacts. And the solution for that is to prepare oneself for those impacts. And the jargon term we use in climate change for that is adaptation. So the first era was emissions of greenhouse gases, the solution being uh, a mitigation or reducing those emissions. The second era started around the turn of the century that says we now have to also adapt to the impacts of climate change because we failed uh, to uh, um, prevent a certain level of uh, a climate change impacts. Now, associated with this second era also is the fact that these impacts, and, and incidentally, this is when I got into the game as well. I, before this, I was not really in the climate change uh, arena. I was invited to be a, a lead author in the IPCC third assessment report, which had for the first time a chapter on adaptation. That's the, 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 the sort of scientific area in which I do my research, uh, particularly looking at the impacts in vulnerable countries like my own in Bangladesh and the least developed countries more generally. And uh, as an IPCC lead author, I got into the climate change game in the science side and on the, on the adaptation side. And so in the uh, UNFCC process, following the IPCC third assessment report, which made this uh, uh, um, assertion that we now have to also adapt to the impacts of climate change because we have not done enough mitigation. There was an associated uh, message to that primary message of uh, impacts, which is that uh, not everywhere and not everyone will be impacted at the same time. Eventually everyone will get impacted, but initially, the most impacted are going to be the poorest people in the planet, living in the poorest countries on the planet. And so what this did was it brought in a different and a new constituency from the older constituency, which were mainly environmentalists, environment ministers were the ones who used to go to the cops and negotiate the agreement, uh, environmental scientists uh, working in the IPCC, environmental NGOs like Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth, not the Oxfams of the world, but the, the environmental NGOs. Uh, but then after the third assessment report and the adaptation uh, uh, issue uh, arose, it linked very directly uh, with the development world because the people working in development now uh, needed to understand climate change. And that's really when I, I started my work in, in IID in London, uh, working on this interface between climate change and development, particularly on the issue of adaptation uh, and the need to bring in the development actors. And when I was in London at that time, I spent a lot of my time visiting and talking to Oxfam and ActionAid and CARE and all the, the development NGOs and uh, bringing them on board uh, to understand that climate change was now an issue for the work that they have been doing with vulnerable communities on poverty alleviation, if they didn't take climate change into account, they would have to, uh, they would be missing a beat and they, much of the work that they had been doing would have been ineffective if they weren't aware of the climate change issues there. So the, the notion of development and climate change started coming together in the, in the arena of adaptation, particularly focusing on the most vulnerable communities and most vulnerable countries. And, and that nexus of climate change and development became stronger and stronger. Now it's very, very strong. All the big uh, development NGOs are, are very much on board on climate change. In those days, I had a tough time uh, convincing them that they needed to do this. Let me share an anecdote. At that time, uh, Claire Short was the Secretary of State uh, for Development. And she was a very, very passionate person individually on development and poverty alleviation. And I had an opportunity to uh, meet with her uh, and in a small gathering in, uh, over a dinner and I brought up the issue of climate change and she just blew her top saying, don't talk to me about climate change. Got nothing to do with treating poor people right now. It's something that's gonna happen in the future. And so I shut up and, and I said, well, I'm not gonna convince her easily. Uh, but then a few short years later, uh, when Hillary Benn became the secretary of state, he got Diffit to initiate a white paper where they actually looked at the impacts of climate change and it became integrated into DFID's own uh, climate. And this happened across the board, the World Bank, UNDP, all the major development actors started realizing that they 
could not ignore climate change anymore because it affected their core business and they needed to understand it and they needed to incorporate it into their activities. And as I said, uh, the developing uh, development NGOs, international NGOs like Oxfam and others have now taken this on board in a big way. And they're all present in the UNFCC COP negotiations. In fact, I used to run a, an event there called Development and Climate Days where I would invite them to come and, and participate so that they could get to know what the, uh, the climate change negotiations were all about. Because as I said, until then, it was very much the domain of environmentalists, whether they be environmental uh, uh, ministers from countries or environmental scientists or environmental NGOs. Uh, now it's become much broader. The development world has now very much uh, become part of that UNFCC conference of parties, annual conference of parties. So the, the adaptation uh, uh, era began around 2001 and it has continued and now it has become quite mainstreamed and, and accepted. There's no arguments about adaptation. We need to do it. Everybody needs to do it. All countries are going to have to adapt to the impacts of climate change, not just the poorest and most vulnerable countries. However, uh, again, you know, we have not done uh, mitigation enough. In, that still remains a very high priority. Uh, we have now started thinking about adaptation and how to do adaptation. Uh, and in the seventh conference of parties in Marrakesh, we had as part of what was called the Marrakesh Accords, we set up a, uh, an adaptation working program and particularly one uh, focused on the least developed countries uh, to support them to carry out initially what were called national adaptation plans of action, which were sort of quick and dirty exercises to identify which were the most vulnerable places and people and what they could do in terms of adaptation actions, set up an adaptation fund to support them, to provide funding for them, for the least developed countries to carry out these NAPAs, they were called at the time. And that sort of started the adaptation ball rolling and the adaptation era uh, started, as I said, initially focusing on the most vulnerable countries, but as, as time has gone by and the impacts of climate change have become much, much more severe and visible, all countries, even the big developing countries, even the developed countries now are having to face impacts of climate change and everybody now needs to take adaptation into account and they are doing that. Um, in terms of the evolution of the adaptation arena, uh, the major breakthrough came at the uh, Cancun COP in, in, I think it was 2016, uh, uh, where they, uh, they adopted the Cancun adaptation framework under which all countries now are doing national adaptation plans, which are uh, supposed to be integrated into national development. And this is now happening in all countries, not just the least developed countries anymore, but all developed countries and developed countries as well. The difference between the two is that the developing countries uh, are supposed to be supported financially. So there's a associated uh, negotiation of finance or money uh, for uh, assistance to the developing countries to enable them to carry out their national adaptation plans uh, under the least developed country fund. And then later on, there was an adaptation fund. And then there was also later the green climate fund, which is the big uh, fund that was created uh, uh, after Paris agreement was achieved in, uh, 20, uh, uh, in, in COP21 in 2015. And so moving forward now, uh, we started seeing that uh, even though mitigation was still happening, it wasn't happening enough. Adaptation was happening, but it wasn't happening enough. Uh, we began to anticipate that there is going to be some level of inevitable loss and damage from the impacts of human induced climate change that we need to start thinking about. It sort of takes us beyond uh, mitigation and beyond adaptation. Uh, and this is an issue that initially came very uh, much from the small island developing states. So the small island states have their own negotiating group. It's called the Alliance of Small Island States. And it consists of about 50 or so countries uh, like the islands in the Pacific, Tuvalu, Kiribati, uh, Maldives in the Indian Ocean, and then a set of islands in the Caribbean as well. And they have been negotiating as the AOSIS uh, group 
uh, from the very beginning and had been raising this issue of loss and damage in particular for the most um, low-lying uh, atoll countries like Kiribati and Tuvalu and Maldives who uh, would be uh, actually inundated by sea level rise uh, eventually and would just go underwater in the end. So for them, it was an existential uh, threat and issue and they brought it up in the negotiations, but they never got any traction for it. Uh, they never got support. They would bring it up, but nobody would uh, uh, support them. And so year after year, uh, this issue of loss and damage got brought up by the small island states, but they didn't get anywhere with it until in Cancun, during the Cancun negotiations, in fact, it was the least developed countries. And I, I uh, uh, played a role in getting the least developed countries to support these small island states on this issue of loss and damage uh, for the LDC. So the LDCs used to think this was a small island country issue. It wasn't important for us. We, we, were, we were focused on adaptation, but uh, we discussed it within the LDC group. And uh, we were able to convince most of the countries that uh, we should support the small island uh, countries on this issue of loss and damage. And so that's where the issue of loss and damage entered the climate change negotiations. Uh, but it was an extremely politically sensitive issue because it was essentially, it was seen as, and in fact, correct, correctly seen as, raising uh, uh, a couple of issues which were taboo from the perspective of some of the, uh, uh, particularly the richer developed countries, which is liability and compensation. So they are afraid, these are taboo words. These are words that are not allowed, we are not allowed to use. We cannot claim liability, we, no, we cannot claim compensation. Um, and so after a lot of discussion and, and toing and froing, uh, what we managed to get an agreement on, and this happened a few years later in, in COP19, the 19th Conference of Parties, when we were in Warsaw in Poland, we pushed very, very hard. The, the vulnerable countries formed a coalition, small island states with the LDCs, with the Africa group, and with the Latin American ILAC group. We pushed very hard to take uh, the issue of uh, loss and damage uh, into account and, and take it seriously and accept it as an issue that had to be addressed and we could not uh, uh, afford to not address it anymore. Um, I'll, I'll just also mention an anecdote that took place just before the beginning of the Conference of Parties in Warsaw, which was a super typhoon that hit uh, uh, Philippines, the island of Tacloban. It was called uh, Typhoon Hainan. And Hainan hit uh, Tacloban just a few days before the beginning of the Warsaw uh, Conference of Parties in, in uh, Warsaw. And the lead negotiator uh, from the Philippines, his name was Yep Sano. Uh, he actually comes from Tacloban and his family uh, is, was in Tacloban. And uh, as the news of the cyclone came uh, to us in Warsaw um, and the, the, uh, the conference of parties opened in the opening plenary session, he asked for the floor and he took the floor and he gave an extremely emotional speech, which I'm sure if you uh, look for it on YouTube, you can find it. And I would recommend and listening to it. He gave an extremely emotional speech saying that his family, he had still not heard from his family, didn't know whether they were still alive or not. Fortunately, they, they survived. Later on, we found that out. And that he uh, wanted the issue of loss and damage to be taken up in COP19. And he was going on a fast. He was not going to eat or drink anything. Uh, 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 until that was achieved in COP19 in, in Warsaw. And uh, in, in sympathy with him, that got a lot of media attention, as you can imagine, and a lot of civil society activists and, and uh, NGOs, uh, including Oxfam, joined him in the fast. So we all fasted together uh, uh, to get this uh, 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 demand. And, and one of the things that we had to address and answer to, uh, particularly for the uh, media was, so what is it about? What, what's the difference between no, adaptation be and loss and damage? And, and so uh, the, the example of the Hurricane Haiyan, Super Typhoon Haiyan uh, was a very good one because as it happened, this was in the November uh, of that year, 
Haiyan was the 21st typhoon to hit the Philippines. The Philippines is, is uh, you know, in Typhoon Alley. It gets hit by typhoons all the time. It has a very good typhoon warning system. It has a very good uh, shelter system. By and large, typhoons come, they get warnings. People go to the shelters, the typhoon came for a few hours, uh, and then the typhoon moves away and they go back to business as usual. And this was the 21st typhoon. The first 20 came and went and we didn't know anything about it. But this was a super typhoon. So they got the warning, people went to the shelters and they died in the shelters. The shelters collapsed. And that is what a super typhoon is. So we could, take, we could use that example to share that Philippines was adapted to normal typhoons. Typhoons come, they happen, Philippines was well adapted to them but they're not adapted to super typhoons. Super typhoons are totally unusual, unexpected, and they are what we will happen, what we will have with human induced change coming around the pike. And so we need to be thinking about unusual events like super typhoons, which are going to cause loss and damage that take us beyond our ability to adapt. There are limits to how much we can adapt and beyond those limits is where we are going in terms of the issue of loss and damage and we need to talk about it. We cannot ignore it anymore. We need to discuss it. And so after a lot of wrangling uh, and back and forth and, and quite bitter, there was a walkout at one point from the global, the, the G77, the developing country negotiation, negotiators who, who negotiate under the umbrella of G77 in China. At one point early in the morning at about 3 a.m. Uh, in the morning, they got frustrated and walked out of the negotiation saying, you know, we're not going to participate in the negotiation anymore if our, if our views are not going to be taken on board. Later on, they came back and uh, it, after a, a lot of to and fro, as I said, eventually at the end of the Warsaw COP19, we got something very, very important, which is called the Warsaw International Mechanism on Loss and Damage. So they accepted that we, we will talk about it. It's a talk shop but at least you can now officially talk about it. And under that uh, Warsaw International Mechanism, they set up an executive committee with 10, 10 members from the developing world, 10 members from the developed world, 20 member executive committee who then developed a work program. Uh, they started doing a lot of uh, research and, and collecting data and information on loss and damage. It was a new and emerging topic. Not many people knew what it meant and what, what was involved in it. So there was a learning curve that we had to go up uh, and over these last few years, they've been working on that. Uh, a couple of important elements in it, which I want to highlight. Firstly, uh, the, the, uh, the array of uh, climatic impacts that cause loss and damage can be uh, uh, sort of put into a number of buckets. There's one dichotomy, which is fast moving events versus slow moving events. So fast moving are uh, typhoons, hurricanes, um, floods uh, um, and, and to some extent sometimes heat waves. Uh, the slow moving are droughts, long-term uh, uh, droughts, uh, as well as sea level rise, which is the slowest moving of them all. It will take decades to happen, but over a, a, a decades, sea level rise will cause enormous damage, not just in the low-lying uh, at all island countries, but also in the low-lying deltas, like in my country, Bangladesh, which uh, has a very significant low-lying delta where tens of millions of people are living and seeing the impacts of sea level rise and salinity right now as we speak. So the, the slow moving versus fast moving events. And then there are two other uh, uh, subcategories, which are economic impacts, which is what most people want to immediately assess. You know, how much money are we talking about? How much money was lost in, in assessing the loss and damage? And then non-economic loss and damage, things like human life lost. You can't put a dollar figure to that. Uh, psychological damage, um, uh, all kinds of cultural damage. When you lose your, your cultural attributes uh, uh, and, and, and places, uh, they, these are not monetizable. They cannot be put into money terms. And, and for many, many people, particularly cultural assets for people, let us say the island countries, in, is an extremely important issue for them as people, even though you know, it's not, a, it, it, you can't put dollar figures on them. You can't compensate them by giving money. So 
the we we started looking at these different nuances of looking at what they meant and how do we deal with them and a very important uh, um, subgroup under this uh, category of loss and damage which has over the over the years uh, loomed larger and larger in importance is in the climate change jargon what we call displacement due to uh, uh, the impacts of climate change and forcing people to lose their livelihoods where they are located in say for example in dry lands in mid continents like in africa and in in central asia in low lying coastal areas like in the coastal area in bangladesh etc and this movement which in common parlance we sometimes call climate migration or climate refugees has become bigger and bigger in the global perception of migration refugees uh, movement in the climate change negotiations we don't use the term climate migrants these are displaced people because of human induced climate change but it is a looming and big getting bigger and bigger issue and under the loss and damage warsaw international mechanism uh, a few years ago they set up a task force to look at this issue of displacement the task force produced a very interesting uh, report which was presented at the uh, the 24th conference of parties which took place in in uh, katowice in poland again uh, and uh, since then there's been a work program to try and address this issue of forced displacement under the issue of loss and damage now where we are now in terms of the progress on this issue and there has been progress not enough progress but some progress is that last year in cop 25 in madrid we had uh, an agenda item on this we don't have an agenda item on loss and damage every year so one of the demands from the vulnerable countries is we should at least discuss it every year it only comes up every few years when there's a specific thing that has to be addressed and last year in cop 25 it was a review of the warsaw international mechanism so the mechanism had a time bound uh, 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 end to it which was coming up in cop uh, 25 and the discussion was should it continue if it continues uh, should it have a different mandate what should we do with it so there was a big discussion around this in in madrid and from the vulnerable country side as i said i uh, we work together there's the the four groups of vulnerable countries ldcs africa group small islands and latin america together with the g77 uh, we pushed for several things we wanted a a technical arm to do more of the research and the science uh, on the uh, on loss and damage we also wanted a finance arm to start providing finance uh, for loss and damage uh, we in madrid for those of you who followed it will will recall uh, after two weeks of uh, negotiations we didn't finish we weren't able to resolve it we went into it should have finished on friday evening we went into all night friday we went into saturday we went all night saturday we went into sunday afternoon before we uh, finished and even then we didn't finish everything and this was one of the topics so what happened on loss and damage is we got the technical part it's called the santiago network on loss and damage which was a good thing uh, santiago named after the the city in in chile uh, because it was supposed to have been a Chilean COP. You may remember that instead of Chile, we had it in, in Madrid, uh, even though Chile was the official host along with Spain. And so it's the Santiago Network on Loss and Damage, a good development. But on the finance side, we didn't get anything. We pushed for getting finance for loss and damage, but they refused, the developed countries refused to give us that. Now, going forward, so on finance, one other element to, to share, uh, which is that it's not that finance is not discussed but what is sort of kept in 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 a bottle on finance where there's a comfort level from the developed countries is talking about insurance they love to talk about insurance insurance is a good thing we have nothing against insurance but insurance is not the only solution to deal with loss and damage and certainly not for the poorest of the people who can't pay for insurance and and particularly on things like non-economic loss and damage so um, although insurance is is very popular for the developed countries and there are a lot of pilot schemes on insurance that are taking place around the world and they have great comfort talking about insurance they don't want to talk about beyond insurance um, and so that's what we were pushing for is talking about finance for loss and damage beyond insurance so um, i'm now coming towards the end of my my presentation we are now gearing up for cop 26 and in cop 26 the 
uh, vulnerable countries, the four negotiating blocks that I mentioned are uh, again joining forces and we will be pushing for the issue of uh, finance for loss and damage beyond insurance to be discussed. Now, it's not a formal negotiating topic as it was in Madrid, but it is a political issue. And we want a political solution, it, which the difference between a political solution and a negotiated one is that a negotiated solution requires all 195 countries to agree. You need consensus, which is extremely difficult. A political solution needs a few big countries to say, yes, we will do this at a political level. And um, on this particular issue at the political level, there is a group of countries that was set up about 10 years ago at that time under President Nasheed of the Maldives, which brought together the leaders across these negotiating blocks that I mentioned, uh, the leaders being the, the heads of government, and they formed something called the Climate Vulnerable Forum, which is a forum of vulnerable countries. They're not negotiating, they're negotiating in their, in their groups, in the negotiations, but the leaders at the higher political level come together and every two years, uh, it, the, the baton passes from one leader to another. At the moment, the leadership of this is with the Prime Minister of Bangladesh, Sheikh Hasina. She has recently taken over from the president of the Marshall Islands and she will be the leader for the next two years, which includes COP26 and COP27 going forward. And on behalf of the Climate Vulnerable Forum, she has already approached uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson of the UK, who is going to be the official host of uh, COP26, to see if we can come up with a political solution on this issue of loss and damage with a number of developing, developed countries and developing countries to at least move us forward from the impasse that we had in COP25. And the, the message is essentially that if they fail, the UK as presidency of COP26 fails to address this issue of loss and damage adequately in COP26, then the vulnerable countries will declare COP26 a failure if they don't get this issue addressed. Uh, now, it's subject to negotiation. They will all obviously have their demands on what they want, but they need that those demands to be taken seriously and not to be blocked as they were in COP25. COP25 was an extremely bitter experience for the vulnerable countries uh, in the way that I just described earlier, and they don't want that to happen again in COP26. So this is a, a big issue politically, particularly from the perspective of the vulnerable countries, and as I said, I'm very much part of the advisory team for the LDC group, as well as the Climate Vulnerable Forum, taking this forward. Um, uh, we, much, much remains to be seen in a, in, a, in a way, the postponement by a year actually gives us more time uh, to develop this idea and see whether we can take it forward uh, uh, in a positive direction together. I am hopeful that we may be able to do it but as I said, this is a politically very, very uh, sensitive issue and it's very difficult uh, to get it going. The last point I'll make, uh, you alluded to this, uh, uh, Duncan, earlier, is the position of the United States. So we all know that uh, Trump has already uh, uh, threatened or officially said that he's going to withdraw from the Paris Agreement. Uh, President, uh, uh, Vice President Biden has said that he will uh, rejoin the Paris Agreement. So we will know after the election on the 3rd of November, whether uh, the US is back in or not. Hopefully they will be back in, in which case then we can continue this uh, discussion and negotiation on the issue of loss and damage. But loss and damage is particularly sensitive uh, in the United States of America. In fact, when we got this agreed in Article 8 of the Paris Agreement, at that time under President Obama and Secretary of State John Kerry, who was in Paris negotiating, uh, they, they only agreed to it by saying that it explicitly does not allow us to use the terms compensation and, and liability. Uh, they, they inserted that clause, which is a very odd thing to do in a treaty saying, you know, what this treaty is not about. Uh, it's not about liability and compensation, uh, even though we can use the terms loss and damage. But anyway, we shall, we shall see where this leads us. It is an issue, uh, my, my, my final uh, comment, if you like, is that reality around us, and if I look out of my window right now, we have storms coming here in Dhaka, Bangladesh. The reality 
is taking us uh, way beyond the negotiations. The reality is that this year, 2020, is not just a year of COVID-19, it's also the year we have stepped into the reality of a climate changed world. Uh, we got just uh, a couple of months ago, another super cyclone here in Bangladesh called Amphan. Fortunately, it didn't uh, cause a huge amount of uh, loss of human lives because in Bangladesh, we have one of the best, I would say probably the best in the world, cyclone warning uh, uh, program. We successfully evacuated more than two and a half million people. Super cyclones of this magnitude had, have killed tens of thousands of people in the past. This time around, there were only a few dozen people who died and they were all fishermen who were out at sea and didn't get back to land in time. Two and a half million people on land got the message, went to shelters, took shelter, uh, and uh, there was still a lot of damage, but the loss of life has been brought down to practically zero in Bangladesh. And so, you know, we are learning, going up the learning curve in terms of dealing with these problems, uh, but there is a limit to how much we'll be able to adapt uh, to these problems and the issue of loss and damage is now a reality that's happening. And it's not just in Bangladesh. In fact, right now in the United States, you have uh, the super wildfires in California and Oregon that are actually displacing people. There are thousands of people who've lost their homes in California and uh, uh, Oregon who are now effectively climate refugees. The cyclones, uh, hurricanes that hit Louisiana uh, just a few days ago have caused a lot of devastation. So these Im impacts are now global in all countries and unavoidable. So you know, we used to think about and talk about uh, a year uh, like 2020 being the hottest year uh, uh, in the last decades. We need to now look at it in other ways. It's going to be the coolest year for the next 10, 10 years. Next year is going to be even hotter and the year after that is going to be even hotter. And so we are uh, headed in a direction of more and more impacts of climate change. Uh, and we're going to have to deal with the loss and damage in every country. Uh, and uh, globally as well. So I'll, I'll stop there. I'm very happy to, very, very happy to listen to uh, Cathy and then uh, take questions after that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Salim. And uh, straight over to you, Cathy, for some remarks, but you'll have to come off mute. Okay, well, I'm really pleased to have this opportunity to comment now. Um, I, was, I have not been to all of the COPs but I was in Brazil doing my dissertation research in 1989. And I remember someone coming to me and saying, you know, Brazil is gonna be hosting this big environment conference. And so it actually launched a lifetime of studying these conferences and uh, the participation of developing countries in them. So I'm super pleased to, uh, and that was the conference then that the very first framework convention on climate change was signed. So this really in 1992, was then the beginning of this whole process that, that Salim has, has described so well. I feel like I also need to say, maybe you hear this in my accent, but I am an American. Um, and so it's an important thing to think about when it comes to talking about climate change, because as Salim said, climate change is a global phenomenon, but it is actually experienced really differently by different groups of people. Um, and even within countries experienced very differently by different groups of people. And um, so those experiences are kind of on both sides. On the one side, there's one set of countries that is simply much more responsible and to blame for the problem. And then there are also the experiences of actually feeling the climate change, um, which was much of what the, the conversation was about today. And in fact, when I think about my own, so I teach about this class, I teach about this in my global environmental governance class. And when I was thinking about one of the things that I talk about in those lectures that you did not talk about so much today is just the blame game. Because that of course, in the negotiations has been a huge subject of discussion from the very beginning, not only when we got to the liability issues of, of loss and damage, but it is, I think, really one of the fundamental issues that has driven the climate negotiations and has to be part of, I think, how we talk about this climate issue. And I, I felt that you as a Bangladeshi and one of someone from a country that is one of the most affected now already by climate change were unexpectedly generous to people from countries like me that are so responsible for this problem. Um, because I think that 
that really is, um, you know, as I say, part of the climate change story, that disjunction between the countries and the people that have been so responsible for creating this set of problems, and then the people who will feel its consequences earliest, that, that fundamental environmental injustice of climate change is, is really very important. Um, but I thought in that context, then it was really interesting, and I would love to have a long conversation with you at some point about, you're clearly more forward looking, I think, than looking backwards and trying to place blame. And I would be really interested to hear you talk at some point about, you know, how, why it is that um, that may seem to be um, the right way to approach things, because um, I think the, the blame is very much deserved by, by a certain set of countries, but um, clearly part of what your strategies are is also to look forward and to think about the ways that um, all of us are uh, affected by climate change. And the other thing that I thought about while I was listening to you was I did an interview a couple of weeks ago um, with Chatham House. And the interview was about the history of the global negotiations on climate. And they said to me, so does the global South have any impact on these negotiations? And one of the things that I liked so much about your talk here was that you made it very clear that a set of countries that do not normally have power in international negotiations actually have been really important to the way that the climate negotiations have unfolded. And I think in particular, the, what, what the countries of the least developed countries, the small island developing states, what they've been able to do in the climate negotiations that they haven't been able to do so well, perhaps in other negotiations, is really agenda setting in, in terms of sort of, I mean, the topic of loss and damage just would not be on the agenda the way that it is without the, the hunger fast that you talk about and without the incredible moral power of the, of the small island developing states and of the least developed countries and the countries that will be most affected. So I thought your talk was really good for showing the different strategies that you have used. And I think for people listening, I think it's really important to understand that the climate issue is one where the global politics of it really are shaped um, in many cases by countries you may not have heard of. So a country like Tuvalu, you know, 13,000 people, but an incredibly important actor in the climate negotiations. And so it, it's, a, it's, a funny, it's a funny set of negotiations because there is a, a kind of power, at least an agenda setting power or a demand power that shows up in the climate negotiations that simply is not as present in say trade negotiations or security negotiations and the like. Now, as you did come around to saying at the end that agenda setting power is not always matched by actually getting achievements on the things that are most important to those, those same developing countries. So that, you know, you know, as well as I do, the finance has never been there it, to the degree that it was expected and hoped for and, and needed. Um, and of course, the whole reason we're talking about loss and damage is because really these negotiations have not managed to solve the climate change problem. And you, you were very clear about that at, at the end. So I think as so often with climate change and development issues, you, you have to kind of hold two contradictory ideas in your head at the same time. On the one hand, these are negotiations in which developing countries have been really powerful and influential and yet not able to push the world to coming to a solution. I mean, in part because of the incredible recalcitrance of the United States and other countries that bear such a, a heavy responsibility. But I think it's, you know, I think it's worth thinking about the sources of the power then that these developing countries have had. And I think some of it is um, really a, a kind of moral power. In a, in a world and in a time when moral power often seems to be very weak, there is a set of real justice claims here that I think are really critical and that, um, you know, very hard to overlook the kind of loss of national territory, loss of life, um, but, you know, without making developing countries simply the victims here, 
they are also then a critical part of this political solution if we ever get to it. Um, it will be in large part because of their protagonism in the negotiations. Um, and then I just wanted to underline one of the messages that, that you said, that the, the, the really critical message that you've been trying to send to people who are interested in development, which is that if you ignore climate change and if you don't consider its impacts, you won't develop. You won't be able to make the kinds of choices that will allow you to develop. And I know that we have quite a variety of people in our audience here, but at least some of you guys are MSc students in the Department of International Development at LSE. And so a, a particular message for you, you know, as you're thinking about writing your dissertations and doing your studies this year, you need to be kind of constantly asking yourself, is the way that I'm looking at this issue adequately taking into account the way that climate change is changing our world? And can I really assume that the dynamics are the way maybe your professor is telling you they are? Um, maybe those are old dynamics, um, but it is something that I would really encourage all of you to think about as you, well, not only finish your dissertations for your MSCs, but also as you move on beyond LSE and perhaps go into development work of various kinds. This is really a call for you to think about how climate change will fundamentally shape what, what you're able to do. So thank you very much. That was a really, really useful and informative way of thinking about the way the climate negotiations have progressed. And um, I'm very, very happy that you're there at all of those COPs. And I hope that you'll be there for many years to come. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Kathy. And a great lobby of the students to, to focus on climate change. But you slipped it in there. Um, could people, the first few questions are coming in. People, could you uh, come up with questions to Kathy or to, to Salimal um, and put them in the chat and then we will start to gather them and ask them in bunches. While you're doing that, I'm going to abuse the position of chair because I, I wanted to ask you something, uh, Salim. Um, the impact of COVID on, on the negotiations. So on the one hand, it's pushed the COP back away from taking place in the same week as the US election. So that, depending on the result, but the current you know, probability is that Biden's gonna win. So that must be a good thing for the, the, the COP process. But are you, is this really a time when you can realistically start asking for lots of money, given the state of finances of almost all rich country governments following the COVID, so the, the pandemic? So, on the other hand, it's a really bad time. So how do you, how do you feel it's, it's influencing? Well, you, you're quite right. I mean, the COVID-19 crisis pandemic has thrown a big monkey wrench into everything around the world, you know, life for everybody. Um, and uh, the climate change negotiations is no exception. However, uh, an interesting feature of the COVID crisis, particularly in the developing countries, uh, which uh, we are in and, and, and uh, to some extent represent in these, in these negotiations has been very much, and I do a lot of work, as I said, with vulnerable communities on community-based adaptation, both in rural as well as in urban contexts. And the COVID crisis has actually affected them very, very badly, particularly the urban slums, which were not only affected by the virus, but also affected by the lockdown measures and economic measures that have been imposed on them. People lost their livelihoods. Day laborers can't go out and work. Uh, they can't social distance in the slums where they live. And so the crisis of the COVID pandemic has reinforced the same uh, vulnerable group of people. And, and one of the things that my colleagues and I are working on is we have this series of what we call voices from the front lines from these groups of people with whom we had been working on climate change but now have also been affected by the COVID crisis. And we're trying to bring their voices out in, in a series of blogs and, and videos, et cetera, from a, a, around different towns and cities in Asia and, and in Africa. And as, as countries are now rethinking uh, the future investment pathways to take into account the pandemic and then move forward beyond the pandemic, it actually is allowing a, a rethinking of what used to be thought of as the normal uh, 
and we need now to have a new normal and people are talking about green recovery, etc. I, I think a lot of this is an opportunity for shaking the box and doing things differently and challenging orthodoxy, which used to be extremely powerful orthodoxy, but is no longer powerful anymore because we've seen where that's taken us. And in fact, the biggest lesson that I take uh, from the COVID crisis is that country by country, you can see the leader of each country to the extent that they were willing to listen to the science, listen to the doctors and epidemiologists and public health experts. They took measures in time, they saved their population. Countries that failed to do that or refused to do that have led to the deaths, I would say mass murders of their own citizens. And that is something that is unconscionable. And it's self-evident. You can look at the countries, you can see which ones we're talking about. And that is in order of magnitude also applicable to climate change. Listen to the science of climate change. You know, we should listen to uh, Greta Thunberg, the 16 year old Swedish girl who tells us to listen to the scientists. And that really is the single biggest message that we need to be taking on board. To what extent we will take it on board remains to be seen. But I think that that is an opportunity for us to um, challenge the orthodoxy. Uh, money is always scarce, but money is never scarce. You know, if there's a will, there's a way. And if you want to make it happen, you can make it happen. Money comes out for wars, money comes out for battleships and aircraft carriers and, and nuclear warheads. Where does that come from? It comes from the same place it can come from if we want to deal with these problems. So money, to my mind, is, is never a constraint if the will is there. And we have to create that will. Okay, so thanks. So we're going to go to Q&A now. So what we'll, what we'll do is we'll take bunches of three. I'll read out the name three uh, in, in bunches of three so you know you, it's coming to you. And then when we, uh, I'll say which one's first, then you come off mute and ask the question and uh, put your camera on so Salim can see who's asking, um, uh, if that's okay with you. And then uh, Salim will take three at a time. So 